that you've given us. Thank you that we are here and that we are in good health. And um, thank you for the college also being back. It's good to see them all again. And please bless us all and keep us safe. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, does anybody have, yes, I saw you, Bessie. Isaiah 58. Jace. Psalms 131. Not haughty, nor mine eyes. 
Have you not known? Thank you for singing. Good evening. Happy Wednesday. It is praise and prayer request time, but I want to share a quote with you all from Desire of Ages to encourage you all to share a praise or prayer request. This one says, in Desire of Ages, page 348, paragraph 2, it is for our own benefit to keep every gift of God fresh in memory. Thus, faith is strengthened to claim and to receive more and more. There is greater encouragement for us in the least blessing we ourselves receive from God than in all the accounts we can read of the faith and experience of others. So your faith can be strengthened by sharing what God has done for you. And with that being said, we're going to take two prayer requests and two praises, well, two praises and then two prayer requests. And those who would like to share, please feel free to come up to the mics, one on this side and one on that side. And yes, we're looking forward to hearing. Number 
this one? Testing? Okay, we're good. Um, so I just want to praise the Lord because coming back from canvassing was a success. And um, the only reason why it was a success was because we had an aim. And our greatest aim was to really reach the people out there in the community. And uh, to be honest, it was a growing experience for all of us because we know that we weren't canvassing just like any other canvassing program, but we were, you know, we have COVID season, right? And it was just so beautiful still um, in the midst of so much that is going on in the world. Many people were thirsting for the word of God and for really, um, they were searching for hope. And it's so beautiful because we have been chosen to, um, you know, just share such a beautiful gospel of hope and to share with them that there is something better than what they're experiencing right now. So it's just so beautiful, and I'm just so thankful for my team, whoever sectioned it out. May the Lord continue to bless you guys and lead you guys to how you guys orchestrate the teams because we all work together. Uh, you know, I really created like a, a family, and I'm just so grateful for, you know, for my team and just the way that they put their input and work together. So praise God. Thank you so much, guys. Amen. Praise God. Thank I you for keeping you guys in. Same. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much for keeping us in, in our prayers. It was a huge blessing. So, canvassing was a blessing. Uh, however, my testimony happened because of where I was at. So, everyone's familiar with Pastor Booth. He came two years ago. He writes amazing books on testimonies. And whenever he came over here at OHC, I think it was around two years ago, I, I wanted to tell him my testimony and maybe see what he thought about it. But the Lord intervened because that was not the right time in my life where I should have shared that. And so going to Rochester, Minnesota, I was back in contact with Pastor Booth and he forgot about the whole discussion that we had. So he just out of the blue, he asked me, he's like, hey, you want to share your testimony for Sabbath night Vespers? I'm like, hmm, yeah, you know what? I like to do that. Amen. So we went to the park and I shared my testimony and God actually led a stranger to come and listen to it as well. Not a church member or anything. And so she got, yeah, she got some valuable information during that time. And um, afterwards, Pastor Booth talked to me. He's like, I'd like to write a book on your testimony. And so... Uh, we spent the next Friday and Saturday in like a four and a half hour long recording session about everything, uh, most of everything. And so he's just finished the transcript of that audio recording, uh, which was about 50 pages. And now he's going to develop an outline and we'll continue from there. So yeah, it's really happening. So praise God for that one. Praise the Lord. Amen. Come on. Same. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you all know that um, I didn't go canvassing during the summer, and I missed it a lot, but I had a super bomb summer. It was great here. Okay. And then, you know, I was here um, during this break, too, for most of it, and I enjoyed it, too. I really enjoyed it. But I was like, man, it's been forever since I've been canvassing. It's been, like, the last time was February. It's been too long, you know? And, you know, God knows the desires of our hearts, right? So Lord knew that I missed canvassing, and he also knew that I was like, man, one team is going to Tupelo, Mississippi. And I was there last year, and I was like, I really would love to be back there. It was just a great place. And you know what? God gave me just that. And so it was such a blessing that he took me back to New Albany, Tupelo, and one thing, the cherry on the ice cream was that I had an awesome experiencing, experience canvassing a friend. The reason why I say friend is because this lady, I made friends with her last year, and she got, it was one or two books, and because we had made friends then, when I canvassed her again this year, like, it was just like old friends back together, and she got five more books, <laughs> and anyway, it was just such a blessing to be able to be back there again thankful that God gave me the desires of my heart. Amen. Praise God. We're going to transition to prayer requests. And Daniel. Uh, so, wait, do I need to... My prayer request is for 
again, I mean, since the academy kids know, my, still my friend Reyna, because two days ago, I was giving him a little Bible study, and he really enjoyed it. Well, actually, Danny helped me out, because, you know, I try to help, make them help me out, because they know more than me. But still, you know, um, Danny helped me out, gave him a little Bible study, and he said that he was feeling down, like he wasn't, like, feeling great, you know, he was, I don't know, he just told me he wasn't feeling the best at the moment. But he told me that after the, the Bible study Daniel gave me, he said he felt good, he felt encouraged, you know, he felt, he felt happy, basically. And I'm thankful for that. But I just want to ask you guys to keep in his prayers because I know he really wants to connect, just want a closer connection to God. And he wants to get closer to him, but, you know, the devil just tries anything in his power to take us away. But, and also for another friend, um, her name is Sophia. I was also given her Bible study, but I was yesterday. And she also liked it, too. But I asked that. I could just keep doing Bible studies with them, but like every single day, they just, when I ask them if they want to, they like, they will have the desire to actually learn more, and just, yeah, I hope they, they just keep wanting to learn more about God, having that personal connection with, with Him. Amen. 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 Baby. All right, so if you guys can hear my family in prayer, my brother last Monday, he started feeling a little sick, and on Thursday, yeah, on Thursday, he tested positive for COVID. Um, and so, and then my mom was starting to feel a little sick too, but uh, thankfully she tested negative. Um, but if you guys could just keep them in prayer, cause uh, a while back, my brother used to have a lot of respiratory issues. And so although so far he's fine, there is a kind of like a possibility that things could go south, like, you know. So just keep him in prayer that everything is, is fine and he may recover perfectly fine from it. And also my dad, because he's also been having health issues. So. For sure. Tomas will be our last one. Mm -mm. Oh, <laughs> my sister. <laughs> my sister called me um, yesterday, and my seven-year-old nephew, like, he got a migraine, and he's never had one. And then today, he's coughing, and he's not feeling well, and she's, like, she's worried. So if you can keep Seth in prayer, and not only him, but the rest of my family, because my, my mom was exposed to him, and... It may just be a cold, um, but we don't know. So if you can just keep my family in prayer also, please. Indeed, Thank you. for sure. Tomas, quickly. <laughs> so this is technically a praise and prayer request. Um, as all of you know, my sister injured her foot uh, like a month and a half ago or something like that. Uh, good news is she is supposed to go uh, take off the cast um, sometime soon if she hasn't already. And um, I would like you guys to pray for that. I hope that everything continues to heal properly and that there are no complications. Amen. If you're able to, let's kneel as we pray. Father, I thank you for another opportunity to talk to you. And Lord, it's always a privilege to come in your presence. And Father, I see Jesus by faith standing next to us as he presents this before the throne as though it's his. And Lord, you've heard the praises. We thank you so much for the things that you do for us. So many things that we don't see, Father, that you do. We thank you for that. We thank you for the privilege to go out and witness, to partake of your sufferings, to partake of your joys. And Lord, we thank you for all the people who are able to receive many pieces of literature in such a time as this. And Lord, we also thank you, Lord, for family and friends and being able to come back, Lord, to an environment where we can think clearly, Lord, and focus back on you, Lord, is always a privilege. And Lord, you've heard our prayer requests as well. Lord, I want to lift up Daniel's request for his friend, that he'll continue to be with those who he's seeking to win to God and to guide them, Lord, closer to you, to get to know them more and more. And Lord, I also want to lift up our sister's um, uh, uh, relative, Seth, I believe, and I'm just asking that you'll help them, Lord, in their health, and not just their physical health, Lord, but their spiritual health as well, Lord. I know you can do all things. I'm asking that you'll draw them closer to you through this experience and be with them, Lord, in this time. And Lord, I also ask that you be with Eileen's brother. Father, you see that he's contracted COVID. And Lord, we know with you nothing is impossible. But we ask, Father, according to thy will, that you'll help him to be made whole. And that during this time, Lord, that you'll help him, Lord, to dwell more upon Christ, to let this be something to lead his mind to think about Jesus even more. And Lord, we just thank you so much for all the things that you've been doing. And you hear all the unspoken requests in this room. Not one goes missing. 
And Lord, above all things, our greatest need is your Holy Spirit. We plead for the Holy Ghost to fall upon our hearts. We need him, Father. Your word says it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. So we need him, Lord, to hear what it is that you want us to hear, to respond to what it is that you want us to respond to, and to even give praise in the right way you would have us to do so. And Lord, as Brother Burgess comes and shares what it is that you put upon his heart, I'm asking that you'll place coals of fire upon his lips and that you'll help Christ to be uplifted in a special way. And we thank you for hearing this prayer. Please continue to search our hearts to give us a deeper repentance. And we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening. Oh, well, it is a privilege to be here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, I'm going to ask one more time that the Lord to just speak simply here, and then we'll get right into this. Father in heaven, I thank you now, and I pray that this message will be will be short, it will be pithy, and that it will touch our hearts. I thank you for the chance to present. Do keep it simple, and may it be something that we can share, that we can live for others. I ask in your name, amen. All right. I had a, a question that came to me the other day. I was talking with somebody on the phone, and, and they had heard something that didn't, to them didn't register quite right. They had, they had had the thought shared with them that, that uh, the law, Ten Commandments, was, um, you know, for those of old, for the, for the Israelites that came out of Egypt, but not for our day. And it didn't seem right to them, but they weren't quite sure how to respond. And so they were talking with me and just kind of asking for my thoughts. And so as we talked on the phone, a few texts came to my mind, and I said, I'll tell you what, I'll just, I'll put a few thoughts together, and I'll just, I'll send those to you. And then it dawned on me, I thought, you know what? This just fell in my lap. This will be what I talk about tonight. And so I'm going to share with you that, but I'm going to share it in a way that I hope is far more attractive and not just sort of the same old, same old right here. So I've entitled this talk tonight, Love. And where is it? Oh, yes, I need to plug this in. I'm sorry. There we go. This should work better. There we go. Love and the law. And so, first of all, the, God's law is expressed as a covenant here, and I want to open it with this text right here from Deuteronomy chapter 4, and it reads right here, and the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire, this is referring to Sinai, he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. Okay, so now, simple question, don't think too hard here. When you look at that, what is the covenant? Yeah, this is the Ten Commandments. I mean, that's just what the text plainly says. That's right, okay, good. Now, we springboard from there. Notice this, same book, but in chapter 7, verse 9, it reread, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God. And then notice this, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Okay, so now we've moved from just the covenant being the Ten Commandments, and we say, okay, I've heard that before. At least I hope you have. But now we're seeing that, oh, it's a covenant, and God will keep his covenant with those who love him and keep his commandments. So in other words, to keep his commandments seems to be synonymous with those who love him, right? So at least intellectually we can say, okay, there's a connection between love and commandment keeping. But things get better. I think they get far more interesting right here. Let's look at another uh, <clears throat> verse right here. This is found in Ezekiel, chapter 16, verse 8. And notice what he says here. He's talking to his people. He says, now when I passed by thee, that is the children of Israel, and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee, that is the end of the garment, and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into covenant with thee, saith the Lord God. And thou becamest mine. 
Now, if you're really an astute student of Scripture, you may notice that I, I took out the letter A, where it says entered into a covenant. Because in English, we can say, I entered into a covenant, or it's not uncommon to say, I entered into covenant. Now, if you enter into covenant with somebody, and then you, he goes on and says, thou becamest mine, what does that sound like to you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because you don't you say, I enter into covenant, like if I sign a contract to, I don't know, buy a building or something. You don't usually say, I enter into covenant with you. We just made an agreement. And I certainly not going to say, well, you became mine. That sounds a little odd, right? But you became mine. Yeah, this is, this is marriage. And so now we begin to look at things in a whole new light. So yeah, I would say that's correct, marriage. Now, let's go on from there. Permanence of God's marriage. Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17 says this, So the children of Israel will keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath for their generations, the everlasting covenant between me and the children of Israel. It is a sign forever. Hmm. That's interesting. So he, he describes the Sabbath as an everlasting covenant. Now, Marriage is an everlasting covenant, right? God says he hates divorce, right? This is not part of his plan. And the Sabbath is an everlasting covenant. So if we put two and two together, if marriage is meant to be an everlasting covenant and the Sabbath is this everlasting covenant right here, I hope that you get this. Could we say that the Sabbath is the seal that God's marriage is everlasting? Does that make sense? Totally new, unique way to come about it, but it's also from a totally different perspective. Now we're not just trying to prove a point. We're seeing the significance of the point right here. All right, move on. Uh, see, Isaiah 56. It's interesting that all these texts are just all over the Bible here. Kind of suggests that this is a message that's throughout Scripture. Uh, in those verses, it says this, For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house, and within my walls a place and a name, get this, better than of sons and of daughters. Now let me just ask a question real quick. Are we called to be sons, or is it we're daughters of God? And yet he says he wants, and so it makes sense, he'd give us, you know, a name. But he wants to give us a name better than that of sons and daughters. Think about that for a second. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Uh, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. In other words, those who take hold of the Sabbath are taking hold of the covenant. Now, let me just ask you. We're called to be sons and daughters of God, and I hope that that is your desire and that you have made that decision. If not, that you're at least wrestling with it. But now think for a second. He apparently has a higher plan. He wants to give you a name, an everlasting name, that is better than of sons and daughters. What name do you suppose that might be? Think about a household. Think about the father in the household. Should love everyone there. What name would he regard as higher than that of his children? <laughs> you got it. His wife. He's calling us to say, you know, in one sense, you're going to be sons and daughters because you're going to inherit. So that's true. But he says, at the other hand, I'm going to call you to be the highest created beings in the universe. Well, the highest you could be is, well, God's the highest because he's not created. He's the creator. But he says, I'm going to call you to be one flesh with me. I'm going to call you to be my wife. You'll have the highest name of everybody. Does that not sound good? Actually, that sounds kind of lame. Does that not sound just in the proper sense of the word awesome? Can you imagine? Do you feel like the wife of God right now, or do you say, oh, no, I've kind of got some trash I'm dealing with? I mean, surely I'm not alone. Come on. Okay. All right, so yes, I, I would say, yeah, the, the wife. And that kind of is consistent with all these other texts we're looking at right here. Now, let's just kind of summarize it so far. The Ten Commandments are God's marriage covenant. They're not just a covenant, it's a marriage covenant. The Sabbath is the pledge or seal of marital fidelity, an everlasting covenant, right? Does that not sound a lot better than just trying to argue with somebody and saying, look, the Ten Commandments are binding today? That almost sounds like, you know, it's an argument of like, do I have to do it? If you turn it around and say, 
okay, do I have to get married to you? Isn't that awful? I'd be saying, well, no, you don't, right? <laughs> I mean, when you get married, you should be saying, I can hardly wait. I'm getting ready. I'm making plans, right? You don't say, oh, man, you, you want to spend a day a week with me? Come on, you know? I really, I'd like to mow the grass. Doesn't that, when you look at it that way, doesn't that make no sense? Okay, it, I think this way is much more attractive, right? Okay, it helps when we look at things in terms of something that we understand a little bit better. Okay. Now, here's a thought for you. So, with that understanding, if we choose not to keep God's commandments, if we choose to turn away from his seal, his, his marital pledge, the Sabbath, let's see what the implications are. Would that not make us an unfaithful bride? Or fiancé, if you want to look at it that way, but nevertheless, you get it, right? It would make us unfaithful, right? Would it not be like we're committing adultery with the enemy? No, it doesn't sound so good, right? But we can see, you understand what the Bible calls God a jealous God? And he's faithful because it, it's marriage language. He's saying, no, this is my wife. Nobody has a claim on you but me. And so what we're in effect saying then is this, you know, this marriage, this, this isn't working. So I want a... Ooh. That's okay. I like it. <laughs> More people should be active. Good. Okay. Yes. We're saying I want a divorce. Why, when you look at it that way, now it becomes not a matter of bondage or a have to. It's a matter of, do, where is my heart? Do I love or not? You ever thought about it? You know, two twin institutions, right, in Eden? What are the two twin institutions? Okay, Sabbath and marriage, right? Sabbath is the capstone of the commandments and marriage. You know, and you might say, oh, yeah, I've just heard that so many times. I just, I just think about it. Have you ever thought about why? Could it be because there's supposed to be a connection? The one is like, as soon as you think Sabbath, you're supposed to be thinking marriage to my God. It just puts it in a whole new light. All right, so now let's look at married life. 1 John 3, 4. You may think, what's this got to do with marriage? This is one of those memory texts. Uh, if you're in Bible docs or had Bible docs or going into Bible docs, I, I know you're going to learn this one. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Everyone heard that, I'm hoping? Okay, maybe you've revered. Okay, good. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, we're talking about marriage and suddenly we're off on this. No, it all connects. Here's a question for you. Leading question. Is sin permissible under extenuating circumstances? You know, I lie to protect because, you know, if, if you don't do this, I'm going to take a gun and I'm going to just, you know, everyone in your house. Right? And you'd be tempted to think, well, I mean, surely to save life, right? Seems plausible, but no, right? God has a way to protect, right? Now, the law and the Ten Commandments, let's try to put this in terms, like, can we rephrase it based on what we've learned? 1 John 3, 4, this would be the SKB version. That's my initials. 1 John 3, 4, whosoever committeth sin is unfaithful also to the marriage covenant. For sin is infidelity to the marriage covenant. Can we rephrase the question, too? Is marital fidel infidelity permissible ever? That doesn't fly, right? I mean, surely my wife would understand. I mean, to draw this person to the truth, you know, I need to spend some time with them. That, that's not going to that's not going to fly, is it? Okay, but you see how the questions are equivalent once we understand that the covenant, the Ten Commandments, marriage go together. Suddenly, the whole concept of what do we? Um, oh dear, what do we call it? Uh, Oh, I'm just drawing a blank here. What do we call it when we say, okay, generally speaking, I do this, but due to si situational ethics, right? Flies out the window. Because suddenly it's like marriage, there are no exceptions. <laughs> right? This helps resolve a lot of questions. Okay, married life in the Bible. Romans chapter 6. This is a beautiful chapter. Verse 1. What should we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we continue in infidelity? Hmm, that doesn't sound very good so that my spouse can keep forgiving me? I don't think so. Verse 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? God's going to make us a chaste version, right? He says, you're not supposed to go back to the old way. Uh, verse 11, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
This, I think, will be interesting to you. If you're like me, normally when I hear the word Lord, I think of somebody who is a superior, right? And, you know, if we don't agree, well, the superior could say, okay, I'm going to kind of lay down the law here. It's this way. And we think of it kind of like hierarchical and possibly even kind of like, oh, I don't want to irritate the Lord. But here's the thought for you. You can check this. You, can, you could get it from Scripture, or if you just want kind of a, a fast way to s- just check me out, look in a concordance and look up Hebrew or Greek, look up where the word Lord is, and see if this isn't true. I'll give you a hint here. 1 Peter 3, 6, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Anybody ever here read that and kind of thought, I don't think I like that too much. Anybody here called your husband Lord recently? <laughs> and you can imagine some husband thinking, well, <laughs> I'll show you who ruled the roost in my home, right? That's not what this is saying. You might be thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe that was back in their day. We don't do that. If you understood it the right way, I think you would say that, you know, this doesn't, it shouldn't raise any hairs. You know, you're thinking, what? Brother Bird is some kind of chauvinist here? No. Did you know what the word Lord in the Bible means? You want to take a guess based on tonight's theme? No, no, not Father. Romans 6, verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our husband. Did you know that the word Baal, Baal, it can be Lord, but you know what, also husband? Oh, so Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him husband. Doesn't mean that she's a doormat, but yes, she recognized him as head of the house. That's all it's saying. Nothing too shocking there. But when we look at it is, we're alive unto God through Jesus Christ, her husband. Doesn't that sound so much more, it just paints a picture of love more directly than the way we understand the word Lord. You see what I'm saying? Hopefully. Okay. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. That even sounds like it could have something to do with marriage, in the lusts thereof. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Not under grace to keep being forgiven for every act of unfaithfulness, but you're not under law as bondage. You're under, you're under the umbrella of marriage. Since when is, when is marriage supposed to be bondage? That sounds like a bad marriage, right? <laughs> okay. Verse 15, what, shall we, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. We already looked at that. Verse 16, know ye not that to whom ye yield your servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey. Whether of sin unto death, that would be obeying the great adulterer, Satan, or of obedience unto righteousness, when we yield perfect submission to the one who wants to marry us, to Jesus. This chapter begins to take on a whole new light now. Verse 23, for the wages of sin, of infidelity to God is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our husband. The one who already paid the wages of sin, right? (laughs) Because he loved us. Okay, so sin and law, yes, they take on a whole new significance when viewed in terms of faithfulness in marriage. Would you agree with that? Okay, I hope so. I'm, I'm hoping that you're okay saying amen. Like, okay, yes, amen, I think. And oh, I mean, we can be bold here. Okay, good, yes, all right. Let's get a little bit of that spirit going. All right, now, let's look at our husband, Jesus, the faithful husband. John 15, verse 13, this is interesting. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And we know that this is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, right? Because he died for everybody. Did you know he calls everybody his friend? He died for, think of the, some of the worst, I don't know, whoever you find to be the most filthy, rotten individual, when you, whoever comes to mind, Jesus died for that person. Wow. And some of them convert. Now notice this. Why did he die for us? Why would you die for anybody? Love, well, love, love right? Okay. Because the wages of sin, the transgression of his law, his marriage covenant is death. Wow. And to follow that is life, life eternal. So therefore, Jesus has already shown himself entirely faithful. He says, not only am I perfectly faithful to my Father's law, he says, I'm faithful to you. Matter of fact, I'm so faithful that when you have blown it, he says, I'll die and take care of it, and we can still be together forever if you're willing to follow from then on. 
That's how faithful he is. He's faithful for both of us. Him and Zelvan and you. Isn't that amazing? Okay, now, the bride. Let's look at the faithful bride. Oh, I hope that we'll get some amens on this. John 15, 14. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Is that good? Now, for those of us that love to read in the original language, I'm hoping all my students say yes, please. <laughs> but for me, we have the pleasure of knowing that not every manuscript reads just the same. I wouldn't say that there's any huge, 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 huge differences, but sometimes you see something and you think, oh, that just rings so true. May I share with you a slight, ever so slight variation here? I won't show you in Greek, but I'll, I'll tell you, it's the word. <laughs> there is a word, and it differs in only one letter. And it's almost, if you read it fast, you wouldn't even notice it. That's probably why we've got a couple different versions here. Here's the other version. Oh, sorry, no, no, it's this one. Sorry, sorry, this verse, excuse me. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, think about that in terms of marriage. If you love me, honey, keep my commandments. Does that, does that, that doesn't, I mean, you see what I'm saying, right? I mean, it's true, but it's somehow, it, it doesn't quite match with everything we've been seeing, right? It sounds a little bit like, like a little bit of force. Does God work with force? No. No, he works with truth, and he woos us, right? Here's where the variation is, and this is where, it, there's one Greek word right there. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That word keep, it sounds like a, a, what we call an imperative, a command, right? In Greek, to go from a command to a future differs in only one vowel. And you make that one switch and it reads like this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Does that sound a little better? It's not a threat, right? It's just saying, if you genuinely love me, you're going to keep my commandments because you're going to love them. You're gonna, they're a transcript of who I am, right? Now, I'm not an expert on you know, critically analyzing the text and everything. But what I do recognize is that option two there does seem to fit with all the weight of evidence on this concept. I would hazard to say, I believe one day when we're in heaven that he will say, you know what? Th oh, that doesn't work, sorry. <laughs> the bottom one there where it says, ye will keep it, I suspect very strongly is actually the reading that he originally inspired. So Jesus calls his wife to be just as faithful as he is, nothing less. It's not a kind of like, you better love me or I'm going to blot you. No. He says, I'm just telling you, if you do love me, you, you, you're going to actually do that. Isn't he going to write his law on our hearts? Isn't he, he writes it on our hearts, right? He doesn't write it on something else. I mean, he writes it on our hearts that where we will to do what he wants. Okay. John 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. That seems like what we just read. If you do this, you will abide. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Not that you might cower in fear, saying, okay, I've got to reach, I've got to obey. He's just saying, you're going you're gonna to love this. That doesn't sound bad. Oh, why do I have to be happy? Man, I've got to be joyful. That really stinks. I mean... See, when you look at it this way, all these excuses, they just sound ludicrous. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Hmm. Okay, now let's examine the heart of his bride. The Bible says that our heart is desperately wicked. Literally, it's incurably bad. Who can know it? So there's got to be something going on here. David recognized the problem, and so he cried out to the Lord. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. That word create, is, it's only used of God. Like in Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth. Only God can do this. It's not like he's making it out of, you know, clay or dirt or whatever. It, this is the special kind that only he can do. Just divinely create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Also, Ezekiel 36, verse 26, God promises that a new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you and will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. See, our heart right now is at enmity with God. We're born kind of bent towards sin. And as soon as we make that first indulgence, the devil says, I've got you. You are just naturally going to want to do what I do or I would have you do. So God says, you know what? Did you know? He doesn't do heart surgery. He doesn't do that. 
unless you t he doesn't do heart repair. He doesn't repair that. He says, it's so rotten. He said, I simply have to remove it, and I, by my divine action, will create a new one in you. That's the only way it's ever going to work. The next verse, I will put my spirit within you. That's the new spirit he gives us. It's his spirit. Otherwise known as the, oh, there we go. I was going to say, my, come on. Yeah, the Holy Spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. That's a force, but by having a spirit in us, we're going to only be inclined one way. We're going to want to walk in his statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Then say you better, you need to. He's saying you're going to be inclined, you're going to want to. Okay, now here's a question for you. Is it enough to pledge our, faithful to, our faithfulness to Jesus? Okay, you said no, because you're thinking, well, that's probably what he's getting at. Why not? Aren't we supposed to do that? You know, generally you offer some kind of sinner's prayer, recognize I'm broken, you know, right? I mean, we do that, right? Here's the thought for you. Exodus 24, verse 7. This is at Sinai. God has uttered the Ten Commandments. He's given the judgments. And now... Moses, he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people and they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. Was that a good thing to say? No. Don't you want it? <laughs> yes, it was a good thing. But I think I know what you're getting at. You're, you're saying there's something wrong with it, right? Okay, what's wrong with that? Yeah, they need help, right? They need their husband. They're pledging allegiance to their husband. They need his help, though, and they don't, they don't acknowledge that. They're just saying, that sounds great. We will do that. But they know nothing. They just came out of Egypt, right? They're just sunk in sin, idolatry. They can't do it. They don't even know how to do it. And you notice how I rephrase that? See, it says, we do. How did that I do go? You see where I'm going with this? Right? You see, we will do. It sounds like a marriage thing, right? You know, I do, you do, right? Uh-oh. Well, how did it go? Yeah, what happened in Exodus 32? Yeah, you've just pledged allegiance to me, and now when Moses is gone for too many days, suddenly you're worshiping this golden calf. By the way, Exodus 32, worshiping the golden calf, comes immediately after the last mm, seven verses of Exodus 31, where God reiterates seven times his Sabbath. It's like he's reiterating faithfulness, faithfulness, marriage covenant, and bam, they're unfa unfaithful to him. Ooh, so the Sabbath is about marriage faithfulness. So yeah, that I do there didn't go so well. It didn't do anything. All right. Hebrews 8, for finding fault with them, the people that you know, were acting so awful there. He says, behold, the days come, says the Lord, says the husband, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Judah. And what is the new covenant? It's a new marriage. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. See, they were unfaithful to me. He says, not according to that. The problem wasn't with the Ten Commandments he gave. It wasn't with him. He said, they didn't keep the covenant. That's the problem. When you run around, is it the, per is it the fault of the person being run around on or the one who's doing the running around? Oh, come on. We're getting tired here. The ones who are running around, right? Notice, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put, you might have thought I would emphasize my laws. It's I will put. He says their heart was just, they didn't even know it. He says, when I put my laws in their mind, then guess what, and write them in their hearts, then I will be a God to them, they will be to me a people. I will be their husband, they will be my bride. You get it? I'm hoping. Okay. Romans 13, 8, verse 10. Look at the heart of his bride when this happens. He says, oh, no man, anything but to love one another. Because Have you ever heard the idea that, well, the Ten Commandments, they don't, they're not binding. That God's replaced them with these two great commandments. Love God supremely and love your neighbor as yourself. That is the Ten Commandments. Notice what he says. To love one another, for he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. And then notice what he says the law is. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Interesting, he starts with that one. Marriage again. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. I promise you will not steal. I'm telling you, you're not going to bear false witness. You're not going to be coveting. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So to love your neighbor as yourself is the Ten Commandments, specifically the last six where we're dealing with each other. So God's bride is going to want to love others, and that's going to woo them to Jesus so they can be part of the bride as well because she now has his same heart. There's a thought for you. Okay. Uh, James chapter 2, bunch of the same thing. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you have respect to persons, that means if you favor one over another, you commit sin and are convi convinced or convicted of the law as transgressors, you're unfaithful. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And notice what law he's talking about. For he that said, do not commit adultery, starts again with adultery. Isn't that interesting? Said also, do not kill. Now, if you don't commit adultery, yet if you do kill, you are become a transgressor of the law. So speaking and so do is they that should be judged by the law of marital bondage. You ever think of marriage as liberating? <laughs> See? You can even put marriage in a better light. God's bride shows his love for others again. So the idea that maybe, maybe the law isn't binding is because we're, we don't, don't even understand what it is. When we realize it's this perfect love for God, it's like, why would we do away with that? Then we have nothing. Okay, the wedding. Uh, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, is a parable about some virgins, right? They're waiting for the bridegroom, Jesus. Matthew 22, 1 through 14, the parable of the wedding feast. The king comes in, he's throwing a, a wedding uh, festivities for his son. He investigates and finds somebody that's not wearing the garment and so forth. And we find out, oh, it's a judgment. The heavenly wedding is the judgment. Ooh, now wait a minute. Maybe we can understand the judgment in terms of the wedding. What do we say? The, the wedding? Do you go to your wedding going, oh, man, I can't believe in an hour I'm going to be bound like shackled to this horrible person? <laughs> no, right? Well, are we supposed to go into the judgment thinking, oh, no, I'm going before the bench. I can't stand this. If you think of it as a wedding, you should be thinking, wow. We should just be running along saying, I can't wait to get there, right? Now, if we're not, it's because we're hiding something, right? Hmm, okay. Got a girlfriend in the, in the back or something, right? <laughs> Revelation 11, verse 19, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. Wait a minute, the ark of his testament. What's in the ark? So when the judgment opens and the temple of God is opened the most holy place, his wedding chamber, the most intimate place, he says, that's what you see there. How is the law done away? This is the union between man and wife here. Well, well yeah, so when the, when the judgment opens, you've got the Ten Commandments. That's, the, that's our focus right there. Which is really just the character of Jesus. Uh, notice this, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Wait a minute. Is that bondage? Let's see. Notice, this is how the bride is going to live. She's going to keep God's commandments because she's his wife. She's agreed to it. She's going to keep all ten of them, including the marriage seal, the Sabbath. She recognizes it's special. But notice this. It's because she has the same faith, or maybe you might say faithfulness, as Jesus. Right? The commandments of God, aren't those God's commandments? Uh-oh, I just lost everyone. Commandments of God, those are God's commandments. So wouldn't it make sense that in the same sentence, the faith of Jesus is Jesus' faith? She, and notice, it doesn't say she has the faith of Jesus. It says she keeps the faith of Jesus. She guards it. Ooh, that's different. She's committed to her marriage. That's all that's saying. Did you know that? Did you know that's righteousness by faith right there? Man, this is weak. <laughs> yes, this is, yeah, come on. Lively here, okay. She's committed to her marriage. There we go. Now, the home stretch here. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And you're thinking, oh, that doesn't sound like that good, happy marriage again. That sounds like we're back to, uh-oh, fear and trembling, and, you know, I've got to fear God and everything. Well, I mean, look. The judgment is based on the Ten Commandments. So what he's investigating is to see, are you a faithful bride, right? He wants to see, is his proposed bride faithful? He's got to test her. It's like what we call courtship, right? You don't just say, okay, 
But you said, yes, okay, good. In about 30 minutes, we'll go to the justice piece and sign off. No? You have a courtship period to make sure that maybe, you know, is my judgment clear? Maybe I made a mistake and let, it, you know, let some time pass to see if, oh, dear, I didn't know. But, whew, we got some serious character defects. We're not compatible, right? That's what you have courtship for, to kind of sort those things out. That's what he's doing. That's what the judgment is. We'll close with this thought right here. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father as in heaven. Do you know your good works can win people to Christ? I hope. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. If he did that, there would be no basis of marriage. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He's going to be a faithful, faithful husband. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled, till all be consummated, you might say. You know what? God never changes. He's just as faithful as he ever was. Wow, he's a faithful husband, you know that? So now, this is usually where I put our decision. This is where we're going to put our proposal tonight. Ooh, yeah. So here's Jesus' wedding proposal to you. Okay? Let's see what our wedding proposal is here. Do you accept, now when I say my, I'm speaking as though I'm the Lord, okay? Not, not the helmet, me. Do you accept my proposal, the Ten Commandments, is Jesus' question to you? If you accept it as a wedding proposal, hopefully it excites you a little more rather than, oh, man. Okay. Will you treasure the seal of my proposal? Like he gives a special pledge saying, here, just in case you want to know that I'm dead serious about this, will you treasure a seal, the Sabbath? That's the special, that's the special, the, the Ten Commandments are the Everlasting Covenant, but he says there's one and one only that he also calls the, ten, the Everlasting Covenant. He says this is special because this is to, to remind you about marriage the whole time. Okay, will you permit me, capital M, you know, Jesus, to make you a chaste virgin? You might think, how can you do that? Because if you're not, I mean, if somebody has lost their virginity through poor choices, you can't undo it. Except, you know, because the Bible says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No, not one, right? Except Jesus. He can say, even if you're not a virgin, he says, I can still make you a virgin. What kind of a husband can do that? I can't do that, right? Nobody can. But God says, no matter how bad you've messed up, if I replace the heart, you start over. You're a virgin. Wow. Will you permit me, again, Jesus, to make you just as faithful as I am? I'm not faithful at all. He says, I can do that, though. Okay. We're starting to get some amens. Okay, we've got to learn. Be, be excited here, okay? It's okay. This is not sinful, you know? Okay. We're not dancing the aisles. We're just showing joy. Okay. Now, so your response. You have three choices. You might think, wait a minute, I thought there were two choices. Let me give you three choices. Number one, I do not. Right? You can, you can turn away from the Lord, right? Okay. What, what, what might another choice be? Uh, well, not now. Okay, well, how about I do, right? Except, wait a minute, what did we just learn about the Israelites? What happened with their I do? It wasn't any good, right? It was worthless. May I submit to you a third proposal? How about this one? By your grace, I will do your will. How's that? Does that sound good? All right. I am hoping that that is your choice. And if it's not, you will wrestle with it. Look at it in terms of this. That God of the universe wants to marry you and make you over every created being, even over Gabriel. I mean, we're going to be the highest. We'll be the ones that, you know, angels veil their faces before God. His wife doesn't. We can look full in his face one day. I mean, how good is this? If you want to just meditate on it, I invite you to close with me in prayer now. Father in heaven, uh, I believe we've looked at some incredible texts in Scripture, and I believe you're providing the right lens here. I just pray. I mean, I know for me, there have been times where things get pretty dry, and I just think, oh, this is just, oh. And yet, I just, I know in a group this size, there's bound to be people going through that. Some may have a good day today, and tomorrow they may be in the, just the, the real valley of just despair. I pray, though, that we, you would bring these ideas, these concepts back to our mind. And that now with this thought planted in everyone's mind, that as they read the scriptures tonight or in the morning, that they will begin to see for themselves this thread going throughout scripture. 
that God wants to marry us. And that he says no matter how pitiful you are, that he can raise us up and make us one flesh with him. I pray that you will cement those decisions in people's minds tonight, that they would say, yes, Lord, begin it. Or even if, they, even if we're not so inclined, that they would say, I'm at least willing to give it a shot. I'll see if you can make me faithful. I'm willing to at least try. I'll try and experiment. I pray that you would transform us, give us a willing heart to be a fully surrendered bride. I thank you now in the name of Jesus and for his sake, our faithful husband. Amen.